Radio Listening Society podcast. Welcome to the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. It's November, and we're spending Thanksgiving month expressing our deepest gratitude to you, our mysterious listeners. Today, we give particular thanks to one of our Patreon supporters, David Feldman. David supports the podcast at our highest level, making him a mysterious master of the society. As a reward, we invited David to join us for a discussion of an episode of his choosing. David chose the story Quiet, Please from Willis Cooper's groundbreaking series, Quiet, Please. In lieu of appearing on the podcast, David wrote some opening remarks and asked us to share them with you. David writes... First, let me say how grateful I am that you guys are recording this episode. Quiet Please is my favorite radio drama series from the Golden Age, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you all have to say about this, the series finale of that wonderful program. David continues, This episode aired twice, once in March of 1948, and again as the final broadcast of the series a year later, on the 25th of June, 1949. I can't think of a better episode for the series to have gone out on. A cautionary tale about nuclear holocaust might seem didactic and trite to modern listeners, but I consider this episode pretty profound. I admire Cooper's choice to use this as the final curtain call of Quiet, Please. I can only assume he was motivated by the same Cold War fear of mutually assured destruction that spawned countless B-movies and Pulp Fiction. It goes without saying, I hope, that I consider this episode more compelling and artful than most of the entertainment rooted in our collective fears of nuclear war. I hope you and the other listeners agree. David concludes, Thanks so much for all the work the three of you do on the podcast as well as the Morals Live shows. I've had the privilege of seeing you all perform on a number of occasions and it's always been a treat. In addition to all the Morals-related podcasts and events, I've always enjoyed listening to Eric's original radio drama project, Shades Brigade. I hope some of those adventures come back to the stage again someday. Thanks again for the countless hours of enjoyment and thought-provoking discussion. Thank you, David, for your kind words and support of the podcast. Now let's listen to Quiet, Please, from Quiet, Please. First broadcast, March 29th, 1948. It's late at night, and a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker. Listen to the music, and listen to the voices. Quiet, please. takes its name from the title of the series. Quiet, please. There are books left. Many books, and I suppose I have read them all. I remember things, too. I remember a long white road between the shoulders of the hills and the distant clusters of the live oaks against the uplands beyond and the wide, light blue of the sky. There was a wind that wandered the edges of the hills that brought the salt smell of the sea so that it mingled with the loamy scent of the grass and made a perfume that I had not smelt in so many years. There was a great plain where the hills fell away in tumbled, rocky magnificence. A plain all cut into green and brown and yellowing squares. And a little stream with bridges of stone that strolled its way across the wide plain and sparkled at last into the distant western ocean. There was life on the hills and on the plains. The field beasts that moved serenely through the pleasant grasses and rested at noon under the shadowed kindness of the green gray oaks. There were men and cheerful women in the white-walled houses where the road curved. And the children that played noisily and sweetly in the cottage dooryards are long since dust. Shall I tell you of the graceful beaches where the sound of the surf was a measured, majestic melody we thought would never cease? Shall I speak of the great ships prone upon the breast of the ocean, the ships that are seen no more? 
Would you hear of the wind whipped nights and the lightning in the forests and the gentle rain in the dawn time? Would you remember and not forget? I remember. I alone remember. This was a temple. And this a place dedicated to the arts. And there where the waves fed up on the beach, the shattered walls of stone we made remained to mock us. And there where the white road was is the desolation. The winds die down, and the sun wanes, and the moon is sickly. Yet I remember the lights on the hillsides and the stars above them wheeling their ancient way across the sky. There was a day when I could name them all. They seem very far away tonight. Antares and Betelgeuse and Aldebaran. Arcturus and Vega and Procyon. In these days, Orion, the mighty hunter, draws away from us. And the glory of Berenice's hair is dimmed in the heavens. I would welcome the sound of the thunder again on the horizon. But all the manifestations of nature are ended. And only the twilight of eternity remains above the bleakness. I would welcome the voice of a hungry wolf even this night. Or the hiss of the serpents that once we hated, that once we trampled upon. I would welcome even the voice of old Krog and listen with delight. And laugh happily to hear him tell again the schemes he dreamed that brought us to this end. it is true that men cannot live without wars amongst themselves... Why should not we be the ones to win the war? Every man plots against every other. And men speak of honor and laws and fair fighting. But if a war is to be won, then do away with fairness and honor, and let us win and be the masters. And they, the slaves. Yes, I could laugh to hear that voice. And to see those hard black eyes glitter again in the light of the little lamps. I could take old Krog and lift him up and say, Look upon your work, old Krog, your work and mine, and the work of all of those who could not live without wars. But Krog is dust and may not speak. And for a little time while I live, the dust shall speak its final words to those who would listen. It was a fair world, our world. And I would not have you believe that all who dwelt in it were like old Krog, plotting wars and seeding the countrysides with discontent. We knew love, too, and all the virtues. Some of them we even practiced. I am old now, and my speech is set in somber ways, for I've looked on somber things for long. But there was a time when I was young in this very world, and my speech was the speech of the young of every world, careless gay, happy. And there was one whose speech was like mine, young and gay, and very dear to me, Morna. There was a night on the shores of a lake when there was music and laughter and light somewhere in the distance. And we sat alone together. And I remember I would speak. But Mona laid a hand on my lips and laughed <laughs> and spoke. Quietly. And for a long time there was only the music. And we watched the stars. Tor. Do you love me? Silly question. Do you? What do you think? Know what I think? What? I don't think you love me very much. You don't? If you love me, you kiss me. Well, lean over this way. Why, you conceited creature. You're the one who wanted to be kissed. Well, I don't anymore. All right. Just for that, you're going to get kissed. Come here. Oh, look out. 
you must sing my hymn. Quiet, please. I tore you to nothing. There just aren't any words to tell you, Mona. Oh, my God. Then the music began again. And we sat silently. And the stars moved above us. The stars are so beautiful tonight. They're not all stars. What? What are they then? Some of them are planets. Oh, Marty. Sure. Tor, do you suppose there are people on some of the other planets? Probably. Earth. That's the nearest one, isn't it? Mm, I think so. You suppose there are people there? I wouldn't know. People that look like us and have, have music and and life like this. Nobody on earth could have a night like this. You sweet. No, I mean it, Tor. Do you suppose they have houses and automobiles and wonderful stores like ours and, and they have babies like we do and... Everything? And they're probably 80 feet tall and have six arms and 69. Oh, no, not at all. And someday they'll come roaring out of space at us in terrific big spaceships and disintegrator guns and death rays. And we'll say boo at them. And they'll all turn around and go right back where they came from. Maybe they will. And maybe they won't. What would we do if they invaded us from Earth, Paul? Fight. I hope we're not alive when it happens. Yes, yeah, so do I. Or maybe they'd be not. Don't kid yourself about that. I wonder what they call our world. Why, probably the same thing we do. Mars? Well, sure, why not? After all, it is Mars, isn't it? No. We were not 80 feet tall either. We did not have six arms or 16 eyes, and we didn't dream of conquering your world either. We were like you. We were human beings, too. And we lived and loved and worked and died. Very much as you do. Look upon your own earth if you would see us as we were. Stand at your window tonight and look out upon the lights of your fellow beings' homes... Look upon the faces of your sleeping children and see the reflection of ours. Let your mind's eye wander across your oceans, beyond your mountains. See all the lights of the world and its darknesses and the sun rising again beyond. Let your thoughts dwell upon the people of your earth. And you shall know us as we were. Neither happier nor sadder, neither better nor worse. Oh, Krogh, the prophet of war, muttering away of disaster, might be one of your own. Marna, with her golden hair and her laughing eyes, might be the girl you passed unseeing in the street this afternoon. And the triumphal arch to a long-dead general brooding above a little park in the city where children race and shout might be the one that stood in the city in another world, a hundred yards from where I speak to you. And here... No stone remains upon another. Old Krogh has said that wars are inevitable. Have you found it so? In the years when I was a reporter for a great newspaper, I sat in his study and heard him speak to us, and through us to all our world. History is written from the standpoint of the winners of the wars. And thus wars are essential to the progress of the race. Had our enemies won in the last war, then their cause would have proved the just one. And we, by losing, would have been in the wrong. For future events would then have shaped themselves upon the basis of their winning. And the decision would have been irrevocable. Future history would be changed. Our nation's bid for leadership forgotten. And thus, it will always be. And then there was silence in the room for a little time. 
And at last I spoke. Dr. Krog, I said. Dr. Krog? Well, son? Dr. Krog, 50 years ago we fought a war. Were we right? We won. And by winning, we charted the course of history in the 50 years since. Had they won, the last 50 years might have been very different. And which is right? What is right, son? And what is wrong? against another nation, and the ones we had defeated before were allied with us. And old Krog made notes in a great black book that was one day to be published to all our world, and no man's eyes of his have seen it. But the sands are running out, let me speak of the things that have perished. Our cities, where people worked at a hundred occupations, in the muddy brown slums of the cities, and the great green parks... Go out tomorrow in your own city and set your feet upon the smooth concrete of the sidewalk. See the gleaming windows and marvel at the wonders within them that you men have created. Touch the garment of a passerby and joy to know that this too, this humble thing, man has created. And know that I too have done these things. And that I have seen man destroy them. And that I helped. Do you know the good black smell of the mold of the earth in springtime? Will your heart leap at the first green shoots of the bounty that lies in that earth? Have you seen the lilies and heard the bells of your churches? The bells rang in my world once. The flowers bloomed and men laughed and sang and hated. We have run our course. The course we chose, back to the ineffable dust from which we sprang. There was another time when Mona and I had been married for many years and the war that had raged across our world had at last flickered out and died. We sat long at table that night, silently, each of us dreaming of a world purged by fire and sword and full again of the promise of peace and perhaps happiness. I'm glad you didn't have to go to him. I suppose I shouldn't say so. But I am too. You're not a coward, Tor. I I don't think I am, Warner. But... Now we can get started all over again. Yeah, we need so many things we haven't been able to get. I can hardly wait to go shopping. <laughs> I bet. Well, at least we can afford them. Some of them. It's just a shame, isn't it? What? I hate those people. The things they've done to us. All those boys dead and our city smashed. Well, they lost the war, though. And we killed plenty of them. Yes, yes, we did. We should have killed them all. Quiet, please, dear. <laughs> All right, you're always saying that, though, to shut me up. <laughs> well, it helps, doesn't it? Well, I suppose. If we could have only said it to them when the war started. Quiet, please. They'd have gone away. We said it all right, only in a different way. Yes. They'll be quiet for a long time, some of them. And some of us. Who's that? Yeah, I know a good way to find out. Well, you go. I've got my eating oh. on. Well? Hello, Thor. Dale. Why, you... Dale, when did you get back? Just now. Who is it, Thor? It's... Uh, Shh. I am Warner. I am home. Dale. Oh, Dale, are you <laughs> Sure. Hey, don't oh. break my rib. <laughs> it's great to see you, boy. Oh, oh it's wonderful. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> well, I wondered when you were going to pay attention. Well, I was so glad to see you. I'm sorry. Well, who? I want you to meet my wife. Dale, how wonderful. Why, you old <laughs> son of a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really? oh, uh, Ray, this is my sister, Morna. How do you do? And her husband, my brother-in-law, Thor. How do you do? Why, oh, you darling. I'm 
centuries of our recorded history when there has not been a war in some part of our planet. And always history told us men have been striving for a means to end it. A war to end war, they said. A war to end war. They achieved it. They ended everything. Wars had grown more and more destructive. And at last, men laid wicked fingers upon secrets that were not for men to know. Men have always pried at the locks that nature has set upon her deepest secrets, seeking the power that was never intended for them. And step by tedious step, they came to the final awful knowledge, to the very corridor of creation and of destruction. Ours was a fair world, I said. There was beauty in everything. Beauty in the mornings and in the red sunsets. Beauty in the long, low hills and the mountains that bore themselves majestically aloof above us. And beauty, too, in the humble things of our world. The, the simple, unnoticed things that, that haunt my memory tonight. The turning wheel. The flight of a bird. The sound of a train whistle in the night. The rustle of wind in the trees. And, unforgettably, the voices of people. The voice of old Krog. Now we have the supreme weapon. There is 
is no defense. And the weapon will bring us undisputed mastery of all the planets. But why should we be masters of the world? Why should any one people be the masters? Is it not written how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity? Men said that, cannot men practice it? And the voice of Morna. There will never be any more war after this next one, Tor. Every one of our enemies will be destroyed. And we'll live happily ever after. No, Morna. There never will be war again. There never will be anything again. For now, Morna, men have plotted against the green hillsides and the towering mountains. They have declared war upon the flowers and the grass and the forests. They have made our planet an altar on which to sacrifice us all. In the voice of Dale. I'll not go to war again. If they bring it to me, I'll fight. But they'll have to bring it to me. They brought it to you, Dale. They brought it to your very home, to your doorstep, to the gay little blue and white curtains at your windows. And you died before you knew it. And the voice of Ray, the displaced person, the alien in a strange land. Who is my enemy now? There was my enemy once, and you, and Mona. And now you are my own people as surely as if I had been born among you. Who will be my enemy when this new war is done? You will have no enemy, Ray. For there will be none left to hate or to love. Fortunate for you that you died before the war came, your last sight was of the faces of those who loved you. And my own voice speaking to you at long last, remembering the thoughts we had of you, of towering 80-foot giants swarming down upon us out of the cold black reaches of space, seeking to prey upon us and conquer us and at last destroy us. Did you have thoughts of us as demons, too? Did you think because we were another world, we must be monsters ravening for your blood? We were not. We were people like you. Older, perhaps, but with the same instincts you have, the very same. We gloried in the summertime and the white winters. We loved individually and hated collectively as you do. We lived. We fought. We died. Your astronomers have watched us for so many years, speculating on the possibility of life here. Well, there was life. Great cities, wide, peaceful farms, tall dams holding back the might of great rivers, great deserts flowering in the spring with all the dazzling lavishness that can be packed into a brief span of life. We had rivers and oceans and lakes, forests and deep valleys, great monuments to our dead giant buildings to house our living. We had music and books and great schools and statesmen. Your astronomers tell you of the Canals that cover our planet. I saw those canals created. I saw the solid earth splash and boil beneath me. I saw the mountains melt into rivers of molten fiery stone. I saw the great tawny mushrooms of cloud erupt from the floor of the ocean. And I smelt destruction near at hand. Yes, there will be no more wars on our planet. There is only silence and cold and dust that was once a people and a civilization. There is only one man, I, Thor, the last man of Mars, to say the last words. The two moons that circle our planet are rising now, Phobos and Deimos, fear and madness. Death himself marches back to the black crate cavern and he pauses beside me to lay his icy fingers upon my arm. This is the end of the world and the people that you might have mistaken for your very selves. Honor us at last with your silence at the end. 
And pray, friends of Earth. Pray not for us, for that is too late. Pray for yourselves. Quiet, please. series of Quiet Please comes to an end with this broadcast after more than two years. We've enjoyed bringing these stories to you. Thanks for your comments. My personal gratitude to my friend and associate Bill Cooper for his writing, counsel, and cooperation. Here he is, Bill Cooper. Thank you for listening to Quiet Please. Thank you, Chappie. Thank you, Bill McClintock. Thank you, Bert Berman. Thank you, Bob Doherty, and thank you, all you people. I hope we'll meet again sometime. For those interested, the Quiet Please theme is based on the second movement of the Cesar Franck D minor symphony. So for the last time, this is Ernest Chappell saying, quietly yours. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. That was Quiet, Please, and the episode Quiet, Please, here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. That was brought to us by David, who is a Patreon supporter. Apparently, he's got a title now of Mysterious Master of the Society. Oh, yes. (laughs) Um, And that is a reward as he is... A Patreon member at the highest level that uh, he gets to choose an episode for us and participate in the podcast, which he did by uh, writing a little intro for us. Making us say his words. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they were easy words to say, though, so thank you. Usually it's two, $300 an hour for that. <laughs> For me to say other people's words, David, so you're welcome. <laughs> Remember, we're thanking our listeners, I know. not the other way around. It's yeah, great. whatever. <laughs> Happy your welcomes giving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I am changing the name of that. Yeah. The Welcomes Giving Parade. It's very American. Uh, so I'm not going to start. I would like, Joshua, just delve in. Tell me what you think of this. <laughs> I, Do you like it? <laughs> Do you like it? Huh? I like, huh? can I say whether I liked it or not, guys? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I really liked it. Uh, I was taken in right away by the higher diction of and formal diction of the narrator in contrast to the usual everyman character that Chapel plays in a lot of Quiet Please episodes and that Cooper tends to write. And so it struck me as a little odd. Hmm. And so I really appreciated it when it's acknowledged in the script, when he actually says, I am now old and my speech is set in somber ways for I've looked on somber things for long. And then the tone changes drastically when we go to the flashbacks of his life before Mm -hmm. Mars was devastated. So again, it's just those tiny details that Cooper likes to include that make most of his scripts just a delight to listen to because they're entertaining on the surface. But then again, if you want to circle back and start digging in and there are so many literary references because he's such a nerd, Willis Cooper. So that's fun for me. And I have to assume I'm missing a lot more, but you are, (laughs) (laughs) I can't name one. Well, he pretty directly references, um, Percy Shelley, Ozymandias when he's referring to Crow 
because he says, look upon your work, old crow, your work and mine and the work of all those who could not live without wars. To me, that seems like a clear reference to look on my works, you mighty in despair. Am I stretching? No, nope. but that's okay. Because he, he also mentions the the statue. And the yeah, and the, I didn't catch that. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I can and, fake it when I'm presented to me. And he almost always sneaks in a biblical allusion. He just directly quotes Psalm one thirty three in here. Uh, it's pretty much the message of the entire play. Is it not written how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity? So there's just all these tiny things. And then it reminds me of other authors. It's before the Martian Chronicles, but it reminds me a lot of the kind of allegorical political stories that Ray Bradbury is going to set on Mars. Now, this is the nice version of Mars is Heaven. Yes. <laughs> the less nightmarish. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want me to just go into monologue? <laughs> <laughs> this is just really hard for me. You read David's words. Mm-hmm. I know how you feel. I, I'm uh, not Greek. I, every version of what David said is right for me. If this yeah. is so lush, so beautiful, it is. I mean, Cooper really poured himself into the script, and it really shows. It's Agreed. great. Mm-hmm. Chapel does a great job. It is so perfect for the final episode of the series. And throughout it, I kept going. This is kind of trite. Those criticisms are fair. And it's somewhat audacious for Cooper to like, yep, I'm going to just throw myself at this and be just a little sentimental and oversimplistic. And because that's the story I want to tell. And I'm going to do it awesomely. It was boring (laughs) for me. It's a guy talking for most of it. I've got some bad news for you about the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) They want to listen. (laughs) If they told me that's stupid, I'd probably agree with them. I'm not going to listen to you guys talk. Yeah, I wouldn't either. Uh, If you are a member in good standing, then you know about our secrets podcast. And this is actually a nice companion piece to the Fall of the City in our Secrets podcast in Mm -hmm. a lot of ways. And if you've not heard Fall of the City from Columbia Workshop from 1937, listen to it. It's all in verse. This is close to being in verse, a lot of this. You know, it's Mm -hmm. it's very poetic, especially for the first 16 hours. I mean, sorry, (laughs) first 12 minutes. And then I wrote here, this is what I wrote. Morna says, Earth, that's the nearest one, isn't it? And I wrote, there it is. Finally, something's going on. (laughs) We're on Mars. Like, okay, now I know the angle of what's going on. He's the last person alive on Mars, and they've destroyed their planet. They're exactly like us, and we're heading down the same path. This is 1949. Is that correct? Mm Mm-hmm. I think it was written earlier than that, 47 or 48, when it was first Still, there's a really interesting comment about bringing back the enemy and marrying them. I mean, that was... Prevalent yeah. Japanese women being uh, married, right, uh, by American men. I mean, I don't know what the stats are, but I knew it happened, and mm-hmm. I know that it came at a cost. Like, that was a hard thing to do. So there was obviously a comment on that, that that should be okay. But that's what this is. It's not an actual story as much as it is commentary. Does that make sense what I'm saying? This yeah, is, yeah. This and I think that's commentary. what it's intended to right. be. So I think the commentary is solid. And well-written and thought-provoking, especially for the time. But it's like reading an essay out loud. In some I wouldn't ways. go that far because there are a lot of dramatic devices being used here. It's a piece that is clearly anti-war. Yes. So there isn't a lot of action. Right. Uh, it's about inaction to a certain extent because he's the last right. man on Earth. Mars. Mars. <laughs> <laughs> but That's it's, it's is- clearly he wants to say something and is putting it intentionally in the flimsiest allegorical trappings because he can. I mean, some of this seems old hat because, like we said, Bradbury's going to beat it into the ground in the Martian Chronicles and a lot of other sci-fi folks Mm -hmm. using this kind of political allegory. So I think some of it has to be looked at in its historical context. And what seems maybe trite to Tim seems because of the time, to me, a little more visceral. I had some experience of listening, and when they mentioned Earth-Mars uh, reversal, that I, was, I perked up, like, oh, what's going on? And ultimately, that doesn't matter. I mean, that, that's not the point that it's on Mars. Right. Mm-hmm. It's not the twist. Yeah. And it's not even so much that I think, like, oh, this is old hat. It's the purposeful naivete of there'd be no war if we could just hang out together. 
the sort of assumption that all wars happen because people are just, uh, I suppose, in, in this point, there, there's no reason at all why wars happen. They just happen because of habit or tradition. Or I see, I don't think it is as simple as that. I don't think he's saying that. I think he's saying there are different paths, and he's condemning a specific path, which is Crow's path. War for the sake of power. Uh, at some point, Crow is not even interested in which is right or which is wrong. Crow says, what is right? What is wrong? It's not even on the right. table. It's, just it's about win. survival and you win. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about the delusion of thinking that you can fight a war to end all wars. Right. And he's calling that delusional, but I don't think that's the same as saying if you don't fight wars, there won't ever mm. be wars. I also think his message of we love individually and hate collectively is not a simplistic thing that's an observation of what leads to war and it's a message of try to avoid that if you can okay. don't That's don't go that I think way where i jumped out, like oh no i can hate individually <laughs> <laughs> it's far easier to hate collectively though. yes it really is mm -hmm. i mean to me what this reminded me of is social media mm. i get angry at people i know on social media who like in person i see them and they're much friendlier they're more patient they're kinder i might disagree with them but it doesn't make me angry because i can see their eyes they s seem just like me and mm -hmm. i think those are the points he's making and to me i feel like we're still grappling with that again i want to say that i agree with everything you're saying all of it i'm just saying it's not action-packed it is listening to someone uh talk about those opinions <laughs> again I got news for you about the podcast. <laughs> but do, do you understand what I'm getting oh, at? Oh, I do. I do. I'm I not just... saying it's bad at all. I'm saying uh, it's not I'm an episode not, of I... The Shadow, is it? When it no, is... it's not trying to be. <laughs> no, Take I know it it's as... not. This is the last episode of Quiet, Please. Right. Willis Cooper indulged himself in something that would not necessarily be a great choice for the third to last episode. Right. So this is an audacious episode for exactly that reason, because it's ideas and not plot yeah there's no plot well plot that he wants to get across is there's this guy and his wife and their their family and they like it and they're happy together it took a while to get there but yeah and i think it's essential that it's allegorical because of the time in which it was written mm -hmm. um, and it's also interesting how transparent it is because clearly within the story there's no physical differences between tor and mm. Dale and uh, mm. Ray, who is the enemy, they give her a vague accent. Yeah, but even that doesn't cue them in to the fact that she's an enemy. It's right. only this idea that coffee is new to her, uh, which mm -hmm. evokes this sort of idea of you know wartime shortages or right. rations of some kind. So it's, I think, carefully constructed that everybody in the listening audience knows exactly what he's talking about. But there's a little bit of a, a safety net to not just say he's talking about American soldiers coming back with Japanese wives or whatever. Right. Yeah. But I, I just like the tiny things he does. I like even in something like this, the way he experiments with writing a scene, like when Dale shows up, knocks on the door, they're excited to see Dale, and then they suddenly are brought up short. Right. And we as a listener don't know why. They just stop talking suddenly, mm -hmm. and they say, oh, oh, I'm sorry. And Dale says, I didn't... I wondered when you were going to notice, and we're still like, what? Right. This is really I awkward. thought it was uh, an injury. Yeah, so did I. <clears throat> and then let me introduce my wife. Yep. And so it's that trusting nature that Cooper has and good writers have that I think I can sell this and I don't need to tell you constantly what's going on. But in that moment of awkwardness you have, you totally imagine and feel this awkward scene of a stranger being brought to the family door and finding this all out in this moment because you had to find it all, all in this moment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the lone standout here. But uh, I also love the use of quiet, please, in this. And oh, yeah, it made yeah. it very appropriate for a final episode. Mm -hmm. How it starts is something romantic and playful, because the first time we hear it, they're shushing each other by the lake and telling each other to be quiet, please. And then they've been married for a while, so then there's a little bit more cynicism that comes in where the wife says, you always say quiet, please, when you don't want me to talk, you know? So you're like, oh, we're at that point in the marriage. <laughs> uh, but then they turn it into this power they wish they had mm -hmm. uh, to stop the war, to say quiet, please. Mm -hmm. 
And the final quiet please is really nice too, because it serves obviously so many different meanings there. Quiet please is a moment of silence in honor of Mars, a, a hope on his part that all wars stop. And it's the show itself saying mm -hmm. quiet please one last time. Yeah. Here's the deal. If you were to hand that to me, you didn't like the word essay, but if that was an essay handed to me, I would read it and go, that's really fascinating. That's really a great piece of writing. That's really cool. It's a great way to go out on Quiet Please. Yes, all of it. I agree with you 100%. I just wouldn't choose that when I'm like, oh, I want an old time radio show to listen to. <laughs> you know, like, I'm going to choose that. Nope, I'm not going to choose that. But I would choose that for other reasons. That message and all of that does that make sense when it I'm does saying? and it's part of what i love about quiet please is he did not no care he told <laughs> right. all the stories the way he wanted right. to tell them they could be supernatural thrillers they could be silly comedies they could be mm. meditations like this yep. on war or on relationships on family um Lady sometimes into a flower <laughs> yes and sometimes <laughs> they were all of those at once um right. i just always will admire the guy who's going to experiment. Um, I agree. But it might He's be, too, brilliant. this is hitting some of my sweet spots. I love this era of science fiction mm -hmm. um, and of writers using fantasy and allegory to work out their feelings about the war. There's such a great tradition of yep. that. I get Which you. I love. Right. <laughs> That's your deal. And I. And so does David Feldman, and he gives us money, so shut <laughs> up. <laughs> That's why it feels so bad, but... Feel bad harder. No, I think it's... <laughs> Here it is. I think it stands the test of time. It's it's classic in a certain sense. If you say, hey, you have an extra hour, what would you like to do? And I say, oh, I'd really like this to listen to old-time radio. I wouldn't choose this. But you're talking to a guy that loves, I love a mystery and suspense, mm -hmm. and I love Foley and being whisked away to somewhere else and... I don't disagree. You that got it's whisked not... away to Mars, and it was just Earth. <laughs> it was the same old crap. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's not escapism. No, no, it's like going to Puerto Vallarta. <laughs> it's like going to Wisconsin. There's a Walgreens. There's a there's a like everything there is here except the ocean. That's my analysis, Tim. Yes. Yeah, so to my tiny little negative kernel there is is actually what you were saying was. He goes to all this work to describe this beautiful world, the landscape, the stars, everything is so gorgeous. How could war possibly be a thing of value in light of all that? Which there's just a little button, like, that's not an argument, that's not a real argument. And if I let go of that, then it's, it's just beautiful language, the complex imagery, all of that, the, the things Cooper's good at, was compelling, and I just, I made me enjoy it. <laughs> Um, if, I, if you strip away everything and just back to some core ideas, like, I don't necessarily agree with that, but if you put it all back on top, like, this is a great cake. <laughs> <laughs> so all I heard in that is Tim loves war. I don't know. Is that what you say? Uh, I Pretty thought much. I was trying to say I love cake. <laughs> oh, you're right. I get the two confused. <laughs> That's why I shouldn't run for president. Let them eat, <laughs> Let them eat war. I declared cake <laughs> on Canada. <laughs> I'm withdrawing our troops from cake. <laughs> no more endless cake. Uh, I think this is a quiet, please, classic. I will uh, definitely agree with you guys in my own weird way and say that this is definitely an indulgence on Cooper's part. But it happens to be one of the things I love about him is that he is able to take his... Uh, whims and whatever personal thing he wants to do and create something that I think is meaningful to him as well as to others without feeling like he's ever pandering to an audience. Um, and I do think it's still timely. I looked this up that like the doomsday clock and it is actually two minutes to midnight right now. It was three minutes to midnight when this was written. Um, so Technically, it stands the test of time. It's it's still <laughs> relevant. I mean, we're about to hit doomsday savings time, so we get a minute back. But <laughs> other than that, oh my God. Eric had to actually think about that. <laughs> oh, on that note, Tim, tell them stuff. Please go visit Ghoulish Delights. That's too much cake. Please go visit ghoulishdelights.com. 
That is the home of this podcast. You'll find other episodes of the podcast there. It's also a great way to get a hold of us. You can send us messages, comment on episodes, connect to our various social medias. You can also go to patreon.com slash the morals and join David as a Patreon supporter. And I do want to thank you again, David, for this episode. Yes. Um, and thank you for that very kind mm -hmm. letter you wrote us. But uh, other listeners, if you're jealous of David, you can go to patreon.com <laughs> and become a member as well. We really do appreciate that. Um, and next, we're going to have a listener guest live in person with us. Uh, David will be joining us, another David, um, and he is bringing a yet-to-be-determined sci-fi classic to the podcast. Uh, so, Eric is probably not going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed for Zardoz. <laughs> Until then. Look out! Zardoz! Zardoz speaks to you, his chosen ones. I've got some bad news for you about the podcast. <laughs> <laughs>